You can go ahead and remain standing. We're going to stand just for a, a minute longer as we read God's word together. I love that at the end of that, Pastor Noah, whoever's up here is always like, you can remain standing so we can read and then half the people sit. And it's like half the people are already like down the aisle, like, hey, what's up? I'm saying hi to my friends. I'm that guy too. Last week, Pastor Noah, I would do it every week. And I know I work here. Pastor Noah's like, remain standing. And I look up and I'm sitting and everyone's standing. I'm like, oh, I forgot again. That's okay. That's okay. Something we do at our church is we honor God by standing for the reading of his word. And we're jumping into week two of the fear of the Lord. And it's a conversation around what it means to really fear the Lord. It's, a, it's maybe a phrase that we've heard before, but we might not have a full understanding of what that means. And we think it just means to be scared or fearful or terrified, but there's so much more to it than that. And so we're jumping in to week two of fear of the Lord. And we're going to go to Proverbs chapter one, verse seven. Proverbs chapter one, verse seven. And today's message, if you're writing it down, if you're taking notes, is called blurry pictures. Blurry pictures. Proverbs one, verse seven. If you're not there or if you're searching for it, you can just follow along on the screen. This is what this, the word of God says. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Let's pray one more time and then we'll be seated. Lord, we just invite you into this space today. We welcome your spirit, God. We can't do this without you. We're here because we love you and we worship you. And we just pray that wherever we're at on our spiritual journey today, that at some point during this conversation, that people would stop hearing my voice, my voice and start to hear your voice clearly, God. And so we just invite you in to speak through the power of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You go ahead and be seated. And as I said, we're in week two of the fear of the Lord. And last week we talked about uh, this idea that oftentimes we can just kind of take that phrase at face value, the fear of the Lord. And we think that it just means that we're supposed to be scared or terrified of God. But in reality, what it means to fear the Lord is that we're supposed to have a healthy awe and wonder and respect for who God is and the power of God in our lives. That he is a God that we are called to worship and hold high above ourselves and look to for everything in our lives that we need. And oftentimes I think what happens is, is our view of God or our picture of God is oftentimes like ha having someone hand us a blurry picture where we take the picture and we look at it and it's not quite clear and we're not sure exactly what they mean. And so we just kind of get this boiled down half truth of who God is. And so we kind of can't see God clearly. And so my hope for you today as we continue in this series and we talk about the fear of the Lord and we unpack what it means and throughout the rest of this series, that you would start to maybe see God a little bit more clearly. That you would be able to see God for who he is and that, that you would see him welcoming you into his open arms. And, and I've noticed this recently in my life is that a lot of times what happens is we get this, this uh, boiled down half-truth version of who God is handed to us. Sometimes even when we were young, growing up in church, we don't quite get the complete picture. And then we, we are trying to make sense of our faith and who God is. And then we hear the phrase, the fear of the Lord. And we're like, I'm not sure what that means. Maybe I'm just supposed to be scared of God. And so I'm just going to kind of keep going. And, and I noticed this recently in my life that my kids are, are they're young. And so I'm starting to try to teach them about God and and who God is, and, and they're trying to figure it out. And so they have this really simplified version of God that they're trying to grasp and understand at the age level that they're at. And, and my youngest son, Roman, he's a big rule follower. And so he loves following the rules. And my oldest is Lorenza, and she also loves following the rules. And our middle child is Nolan, and he likes to test the rules. And so he's always out there doing things. And Roman is more responsible, even though he's two years younger than Nolan, uh, he's taken up the responsibility of caring for Nolan. So I'll, I'll always be walking into rooms and Roman's like, Nolan, don't do that. Nolan, remember, we're not supposed to do that. And so Roman, he's like basically becoming Nolan's parent. Like he's starting to like, you know, try and like come up with different strategies to get Nolan to behave. And so now he came up with like, with this line, maybe someone's dropped this on you in your life, I wonder, where Nolan starts to do bad stuff and Roman will go, hey, hey Nolan, remember, Jesus is watching you. And I'm like, where did he get that from? <laughs> I thought it was kind of funny. And it kind of works too. So I was like, eh, we'll roll with it for right now. <laughs> and it has happened recently. Just last week, we were trying to get out the door for school. And Lorenzo was getting all of her clothes on, her shoes. Roman was already dressed, ready to go. He's sitting on the bench by her back door. And Nolan's laying on the floor. He's like, I don't want to go to school. 
I'm starting to get a little bit frustrated. I'm like, buddy, we got to get out and we got to go to school. I know that it's hard to go to school, but guess what? You're in first grade and there's like 12 more years of this. So <laughs> get ready, sailor. I didn't say that part. <laughs> and so I'm trying to get him up and Roman just looks over and he goes, Nolan, remember, Jesus is watching you. And I was like, that's right, Nolan, get up. Jesus is watching you. I'm kidding. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I just kind of try to move by because I'm like, that's kind of true. And I think maybe that's what's happened to us in our lives is we were handed this picture of God that was a boiled down half truth. And that is kind of a small sliver of what it means to feel the, fear the Lord. But there's so much to it than that. But we were handed this blurry picture of God. And because we got handed a half truth of who God is and how we're supposed to relate to God, we're confused and we're frustrated because we're not sure how we're supposed to relate to God. And I heard one pastor say it this way, and I think what was happening underneath what Roman is, is saying to my son Nolan, what he's really saying is, you better behave or else. And I think sometimes we get this story about God that, that God's relationship to us is just about our behavior. That God just wants us to behave a certain way or else. And that's a boiled down half-truth version of the totality of what it means to interact and be in a relationship with God. And I heard one pastor put it this way. He said, a lot of times the story that we get is that if you come to God, you'll learn how to behave. But there's more to it than that. He said, the reality is, is that when you come to God, you will live. And you will really experience life. And I think for us, I can't help but wonder for you if there's been moments in your life where you, someone handed you a blurry picture of God and it didn't quite make sense and it didn't quite compute because it wasn't the full picture of who God was. And so my hope for you is that over the next few moments as we continue this conversation, that God would come more into focus for you as you begin to understand him, who he is, and what it means to fear the Lord. And so I want to walk through a few reasons why I think we don't fear the Lord. I want to walk through a couple reasons why I think that we stay away from God and we don't engage with God in a healthy way with a healthy fear of who he is and what our relationship to him is supposed to be like. So I want to walk through a few reasons why I think we don't fear the Lord. And then I want to encourage you with a few ways that you can practice and engage with and go deeper in your understanding of the fear of the Lord. Sound good? And I think what happens sometimes for us as individuals is we, is we grew up in a culture where the, underneath all of American culture for the last, you know, decades, there's just this underneath hum of Christian culture that we're just aware of it, whether we say we're one nation under God or we have the Ten Commandments on our government buildings or maybe you said a prayer at the dinner table or maybe you went to church twice a year, whatever it is, we have this over-familiarity with God. And because we're overly familiar with God, we haven't treated God with the respect and honor that he's due because it's just something that is too familiar to us. And so for you, you might have grown up and you might have gone to church twice a year. Or maybe God was someone that you heard about, but you never really came to know yourself. And you started to get this image of God where he just wanted you to behave a certain way or he wanted you to do these certain things so that you would be accepted by him. And you never quite knew how you could come and be in a relationship with God. And so we just had this familiar story. I know this happened to me recently. I, I love talking to my friends who don't know Jesus, about Jesus, when it comes up in conversation. And, and I roll up to the gym one day, and my friend comes up to me. He goes, how do you interpret John 3.16? And I was like, dude, I'm just trying to listen. Wait, man. And, and he's like, how do you interpret John 3.16? And if you don't know John 3.16, it's one of the most famous Bible verses in the Bible. It's for God so loved the world that he sent his only son. Whoever believes in Jesus will not perish but have eternal life. So he's asked me about this verse, and, and that's a common verse. And if you look in the end zone in the Super Bowl, you'll probably see a giant sign that says John 3.16. And there's just this hum of Christianity underneath the culture that we live in that we've just become familiar with that story. So he looks to a guy over next to us working out, and he says, what do you think about John 3.16? And that guy goes, I don't know what that is. And I'm like, so this is the verse that you know, people often reference in Christianity. And I say, he's like, oh, yeah, I know that verse. I know that verse. It's just this familiar thing that we've come to know in our lives. And because we've become so familiar with it, we've lost our awe and wonder of who God is and the story that God is writing in human history. So much so that we've just left it behind. And what it's produced in us is that we've become too familiar with a God that we barely even know. That we've become familiar with this cultural Christianity that's all around us, but we've never really come to know God for ourselves. And it's actually amazing because this is probably mostly true for many millennials and every generation above millennials. 
that we grew up in this Christian culture and it was kind of around us and we've become familiar with it. But in Gen Z and the younger generations, they're actually growing up in what would be defined as more of a post-Christian culture. And so what people who study generations and specifically Christianity in generations have found is that Gen Z and younger generations are actually coming up without any knowledge of the gospel at all. So for them, it's brand new. And what's interesting is that there's large numbers. I think the last number I saw, I'm not going to say it because I'm going to mess it up, but there's, there, there's higher numbers than people are surprised by this, that there's so many gen, kids in Gen Z that are saying, I'm actually interested in learning more about Jesus because I don't know anything about it. Because it's not familiar to them. It's something brand new that they're able to engage with and experience the awe and wonder of for what it is. And so I think sometimes we don't draw close to God as individuals because we've become too familiar with the story. It just becomes a cliche or a platitude that we say. But God is saying, no, 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 I want you to take one step further and come to know me. And the second reason I think is as a society, we've started to just treat everything as common. Everything in our society is just set up for us to consume it. And there's no sacred spaces and there's no sacred people. We don't even treat each other as sacred anymore. That our society is a space where no one is sacred and no thing is sacred. In fact, everything is common. And I remember I saw this recently in an interview. There was, I was watching this political interview and there was a moderator and there was a guy on his right that was a general. And he had spent years in Afghanistan and in war and he had left behind his family and sacrificed and served so that our country could remain a free democracy. And then he was debating this other person on the other side of the, his political aisle. And this person was a young person about my age. And he was a political commentator. That was his career. And the young person was speaking during this interview so condescendingly and arrogantly and down to this general that the moderator actually stopped him in the middle of the conversation. He said, hey, I just want to remind you that this guy right here, regardless of the disagreements you have, he's uh, sacrificed his entire life and left behind his family and served his country so that you can have the freedom to say everything that you're saying right now. You should show him a little bit more respect. And that moderator didn't even agree with that guy. And I remember I saw that and I thought, wow, we don't even respect each other. And it's impossible for our parallel relationships to not affect our upward relationship with God. And I think at the core, the reason that we, that we do this is because we don't really trust that God is with us and for us because we don't really know him for ourselves. And so we've decided to say, I'm going to define how I should live my life and what I should do and what's right and wrong in the world myself. In fact, we're encouraged to do that. Hey, if you really want to know what you should do, you should look within what's true for you and what should you do. And we see this even at the beginning of the scriptures in the Garden of Eden, at the beginning of the Bible in the book of Genesis. God sets out this beautiful garden and he creates man and woman and he establishes Adam and Eve in the garden. And he says, hey, uh, you can eat of any tree in this garden, but don't eat of this one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he says, if you live within the context of my wisdom and if you live within the context of how I've created you to live, you will really experience the life that I created you to have. And then Satan comes along and he says, is that really a command that God gave you? Did God really say that? And he gets them to question it. And then Eve eats of this tree and gives it to Adam and they're immediately aware of their nakedness and their shame and so they hide. And God comes into the garden and he moves into the garden. He calls out to them and Adam came out and he said, he, he said I was hiding from you because I was naked and I was ashamed. And the first question that God asks to Adam is, he looks at him and he says, who told you that you were naked? And what Adam is saying, or what God was saying to Adam in that moment is he's saying, what voice did you decide to follow besides my voice? And I want you to know that when you depart from me and my wisdom and what I have for you, you're going to leave behind the life that I have for you and you're only going to experience death. And what Adam and Eve were doing in that moment is they were saying, well, we're going to choose to live by our own wisdom. We're going to choose to find good and evil for ourselves and we're going to ignore the wisdom of God and it leads to the brokenness that they experience in their lives. And so the invitation for the fear of the Lord and in order to embrace and practice the fear of the Lord, we need to put God in his proper place. To fear the Lord means that I'm going to live my life by God's wisdom. I'm going to gain my identity, make my choices and get my meaning in life from God, not somewhere else or on my own. And that's why God says in the scriptures, Proverbs chapter one, verse seven, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, 
but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And so what God is saying is, is that if you fear the Lord, if you worship and honor and revere and respect God for who he is in your life, you will live by his wisdom. And the invitation on the other side of that decision is, is to experience life, to truly live and be set free from the power of evil and sin that is trying to corrupt us. And though, so there's a couple of things that I think that if we lean into and we understand will help us to grow and practice the fear of the Lord and what that means. And the first is something that as I was studying for this, it kind of took me by surprise. I didn't even realize that this was a way that you could engage with and go deeper in your, not only your relationship with God, but your understanding of the fear of the Lord. Psalm uh, 130 verses three through four says this, Lord, if you kept a record of our sins, who, O oh Lord, could ever survive? But you offer forgiveness that we might learn to fear you. I'm going to read that again. Lord, if you kept a record of our sins, who, O oh Lord, could ever survive? But you offer forgiveness that we might learn to fear you. And I love that because the psalmist is writing, and he's just so honest about us. And he's like, let's be honest. If we really kept a record of all of our rights and wrongs, like who of us could honestly survive? which this has always been a challenge for me because I'm like, really, if I just live on my own, I'm really gonna create this destruction and death and, and not experience the life that God has for me because I know a lot of people that aren't Christians and they seem pretty great, seem, seem fine. Don't seem to be doing terrible things. But then as I look across our society, I'm like, oh my gosh, what's wrong with us? Have you ever felt that way? And, and I look across our society and we hate each other. We're always at war. In fact, as a human race, we've never known peace. There's something inside of us. And, and oftentimes I try not to judge the people around me, but I just look within and I'm like, well, what I definitely know is that there's something broken inside of me, that there's something dark that's trying to take over my soul. And I'm just gonna take a, a guess and say, I'm guessing that might be happening inside of you as well. And this, this thing that is so interesting to me is that part of the problem with uh, the problem of evil, where people say, if God is so good, why does he allow all these bad things to happen in the world? Is that if you actually like, look into it, what you realize is that most of the evil in the world is caused by us. We do it to each other. And most of the stuff in the world that has gone bad or gone wrong is the production of what's inside of our souls. And I love how honest the psalmist is that he says, uh, if God actually kept a record of our sins and held us to it, who could ever survive? But then he continues and said, but God offers his forgiveness that we might learn to fear him. What does that mean? That means that when you experience God's forgiveness, you become keenly aware of the massive gap between your brokenness and God's goodness. And this produces a healthy fear in us that causes us to worship and to reorient ourselves to God in a way where you desire to obey him and to live for him and by his commands because in him is the life that your soul is searching for. It's because in God, there is no evil thing. God is perfect. God is the epicenter of love and goodness and life and justice. And when we come into contact with God, the first thing that you'll realize is that you are far more broken than you could ever even imagine. But the beautiful thing is that even in the midst of that, you are far more loved than you could ever realize. And we see this happen to people in the scriptures. There's this guy named Isaiah. And in Isaiah chapter six, he's commissioned to be a prophet. And in the Old Testament, we see his, a little bit of his story. And there's this moment in Isaiah chapter six where Isaiah sees the glory of the Lord. He sees this vision of God's glory. And he says that I saw God sitting on his throne. And he had, describes this beautiful vision of God that his robe is coming down from his throne. And there's these angels around him singing his praises. And, and Isaiah sees this image and this vision of God's glory and who he is. And I love Isaiah's response because it's my response too. And he sees his glory and he says, woe to me for I'm a man of unclean lips and I live amongst a people of unclean lips and I've seen the glory of the Lord. And really what that means is Isaiah is just becoming really aware of his own personal brokenness. That there's something inside of him that needs healing. And this is the beauty of the story of Christianity. It's not that God's just trying to get you to behave, but that he's trying to give you life. And so he made a way for you to be with him when he stepped into human history in the person of Jesus. And he took on all of our evil and he took it on the cross and he died and he rose again. He was declaring that there's no evil in this world that could overcome God's love. 
And he took on all of our evil that we had and he exchanged his life for us. And so when you embrace and you understand God's forgiveness, you're gonna have this holy fear. And I love that there's so many moments in the Old Testament, in the Bible, when people come into God's presence and they're kind of terrified. They're struck by the wonder and the awe and the massiveness of who God is and how good he is and how broken they are. And what happens on the other side of that is that God invites us in. Right after that moment with Isaiah, it says that an angel came and cleansed Isaiah's lips. And then he sent him on a mission for God. And so while there's this, there's this beauty in God, there's this, this reality of God's goodness and who he is, God doesn't want us to stay far from him, but he wants to invite us in. And that's what he did through the person of Jesus. And the second thing I want us to do to practice the fear of the Lord is to place an unconditional, probably scary level of trust in God in all of our circumstances. To fear the Lord means that I'm going to trust God even when life doesn't make sense. Even when the circumstances around me aren't circumstances that I can fully understand, I'm gonna say, God, I believe that you are better and that you are higher and that you are more wise and that no matter what's happening in my life, that you're actually with me. There's a woman that I, I read recently, she was writing, uh, she's a writer and she wrote this story about how she was at a farm. And at this farm, she saw a shepherd uh, dealing with his sheep and she writes about her experience on this farm. And she watched a shepherd bring these sheep into a barn and he brought them in and he had to dip them into this antiseptic tank. And the reason he had to dip them into an antiseptic tank was because if they didn't wash the sheep every so often, the sheep would get these parasites and they would die. And so the, the shepherd is out in his field and he's bringing these sheep into the barn. And as he's doing it, the sheep are kind of trying to get away. And there's the sheep dog that would come and he would bite the legs of the sheep so that they would stay in line. And he would bring them into this barn. And she said she would witness one by one as the shepherd would grab them by their neck or by the horns and would pull them into this antiseptic tank. And they were trying to get out of it and they were wrestling against it. And this dog would come around and bite them so that they would stay in line. And then he would have to hold them under the antiseptic for a few moments so they'd be completely submerged before they could be set free. And he would do this so that they would live, so that they wouldn't be overcome by parasites. And this woman was writing and she said, man, I wish that I could explain to the sheep everything that was going on. But then she chuckled herself because she, she started to imagine herself trying to explain that to sheep. And she's like, all that she needed to really, all that the sheep really needed to do was to trust their shepherd in that moment. And that's how it is with you and I and God. And we see this in the scriptures. In the Old Testament, there's uh, the people of God, the Israelites, and they're in exile in this foreign nation. And there's these three dudes with these crazy biblical names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those are the names. I wish they could have like updated them with like English names like John and Frank and some other name. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they're in this foreign land and the, the king of that land, his name was King Nebuchadnezzar. And he said, I'm gonna build this statue to myself. I want everyone to bow down and worship. But they were like, uh, we actually only fear the Lord. And so uh, we honor God and we worship God alone. So we're not gonna bow to this idol. And so King Nebuchadnezzar is like, that's cool, I'm gonna kill you. And they're like, all right, I guess that's how that's gonna go. And so he sets this giant furnace and he sets it to 10 times the heat of that it normally is. And he throws them into this furnace and he's watching them burn. And then he realizes, oh, they're actually not on fire. They're actually not burning at all. And he started counting them. He's like, am I crazy or are there four people in there? And he sees in this furnace that the three men that he had thrown in there are now accompanied by what he would describe as the angel of the Lord. So he looks like there's a son of God in there with him. And it's this beautiful picture that even in the midst of everything they were going through, they might have been flying into that fire like, really? This is how this is going to go down? Fire? All right. And they get in there and they realize that, oh, actually God was with them in the midst of all, and he delivered them from it. And there's this beautiful image that even though for them, they probably couldn't make sense of that moment before it happened or as it was happening, but God was actually with them the whole time. And he delivered them through it. And see, what the beautiful thing about fearing the Lord is, is that when you fear God, you don't actually have to fear anything else. And I love the way that Pastor Erwin McManus put it. He wrote uh, in one of his books, and he said this, that what you fear will establish the boundaries of your freedom. Whatever it is that you fear in your life will establish the boundaries of your freedom. And so if you're scared of heights, you're going to stay low. If you're scared of the dark, you're going to stay in the light. If you don't like the ocean, you're not going to go to Florida. And whatever you feel, fear will establish the boundaries of your freedom. 
And that's why God says, if you fear me, you will live. I have life that comes. And that's why the scriptures say that perfect love casts out all fear. Because on the other side of the fear of the Lord is a loving, ongoing relationship with the God that created the universe. And he's like, if you fear me, I will eradicate all the other fears in your life. And I will walk with you in every circumstance that you find yourself in. And so to fear the Lord means that I'm going to place a scary level, unconditional trust in God in all of my circumstances. And so we have to embrace God's forgiveness and understand the magnitude of God's goodness. And how even in the midst of our brokenness that God still saw us and loved us. The second is we need to trust God in all of our circumstances. And the last thing I'll close with this is that we are called to live by his wisdom. That the invitation for us and for all of humanity is to live by God's wisdom. What does that mean? It means that all of my actions, all of my choices, all of the things that I believe to be good or bad in the world will be defined by God, who he is, who he's called, to be, called me to be, and who he's called me to be according to his word. I love that the psalmist writes this, Psalm 119, verse 32. The psalmist writes and says, I run in the path of your commandments, for you have set my heart free. I run in the path of your commandments, for you have set my heart free. And that's an interesting thing to read for me as I'm reading that, as I'm studying that, I'm thinking I wouldn't naturally equate God's commandments with freedom or any commandments with freedom, right? Right? I would naturally think to myself, the more commands I have, the more that's going to kind of fence me in and stop me from being free. Wouldn't you naturally think that if you're really going to be free, then you're not going to have any boundaries at all? It's breaking out and stepping out into whatever it is that you want in your life. But in reality, the psalmist is writing, he's saying, no, I'm actually going to run in the path of God's commandments because it's in the context of living by God's wisdom and who God has called me to be that I'm going to experience life and life in abundance. And so God's wisdom will help us to create a beautiful life. When you live by God's wisdom, you will be able to create a beautiful life. You'll be able to experience healing and transformation so that you're no longer guided by greed or hatred or unforgiveness or bitterness or rage or any of the things that are trying to overtake us. Instead, you'll be able to be led by forgiveness and generosity and goodness and every good thing. And you'll be able to step into the future that God has for you, experiencing the healing that he has for you. I love in in, in the book of Proverbs, if you read Proverbs, the writer of Proverbs personifies wisdom, God's wisdom, as a woman. And it says at the beginning of Proverbs that that she is walking around the streets calling out for for anyone who would listen. And so it's this beautiful picture of God's wisdom. And in Proverbs 3, 17 through 18, the writer writes and says this, her ways, meaning God's wisdom, are pleasant ways and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her. Those who hold her fast will be blessed. That when you choose to live by God's wisdom, you can step into the future that he has for you and you can create the life that he has called you to create and to live. And I'll close with this story. I'll close. I might, I, you might have heard this story before, and if you have, I'm sorry. But I don't know about you, but there's moments in life that really mark you and they stay with you for a long time. Have you ever had that happen? Sometimes good, sometimes bad. And there was this moment when I was on tour as a touring musician, and we were playing the show with a band, and these, this band was not a Christian band at all and that we were playing with. And uh, we... I had this song called I Want to Feel Alive and the refrain in the song over and over goes on, I want to feel alive, I want to feel alive, I want to feel alive. And we just sing that over and over throughout the song. So it had been like five nights on tour and we were with this band and this girl comes up and, and she's not a Christian at all, not even close. And she comes up after one of our shows and she's, she's crying. She's like tears running down her face. She said, um, there's something about that song. There's something about that song that is speaking to me because I want to be alive too. And I remember that moment I thought to myself, yeah, so do I. And so I'll end where I started, which is that the fear of the Lord is not about you behaving. It's about you experiencing life. And so when you come to God, he won't just get you to behave, but he'll teach you how to live. 
and how to experience the life that your soul has been craving, the freedom that your soul has been craving, the future that your soul has been craving, because every good thing that your soul is looking for comes from God. And so the invitation for you right now is simple. Come near to God. And when you're searching for God, a lot of times you say, oh, I'm searching for God. I'm looking for God. I'm trying to figure out if God's real. But when you come face to face with God, you realize that his name is Jesus. And that he's actually been searching for you all along. The apostle Paul writes in the book of Acts in the New Testament in Acts chapter 17, and he says this. He says, God pre-planned ahead of time every place that every human being who ever lived would live. And he picked out the time that you would live. And he did this so that every person would reach out to him and find him. And then he closes that portion of scripture by saying this, because he is not far from any one of us. That when you truly experience the fear of the Lord, you'll be taken aback by God's goodness, by his purity, but then you'll also be welcomed in by his love. And you'll be able to live by his wisdom and you'll be able to step into the life that your soul has been searching for. And so I just wanna take a moment, I wanna pray for you. You can close your eyes, you can bow your head. And Juan, I just wanna pray for you that you would experience God's goodness. I hope that at some point during this conversation today, you just started to hear a voice inside of you that started to call out that is drawing you closer. And I want you to just listen to that voice. That's the voice of God. And so if you're here today and you're like, man, I wanna cross that line of faith. I wanna experience God. I wanna receive the life that Jesus has for me. I wanna give my life to Jesus. If you wanna make that decision today to welcome Jesus into your life, I just wanna lead you in a brief prayer. And you can repeat this prayer out loud after me. And this is just a prayer between you and God. This isn't the end of the conversation. This is the beginning of a conversation and a relationship that'll go on for the rest of eternity between you and God. So that's you and you wanna to make that declaration today, just repeat this prayer after me and I invite everyone to say it as a declaration of our faith. Say, Jesus, I give you my life. I'm all in, no turning back. I believe you came to die for me. And today I receive the life that you have for me. Amen. And I just wanna pray for everyone in this room. Lord, we just welcome you. God, there's so many moments in our life where we're stuck with a blurry picture of who you are and we're desperately searching for you and we want to know you. We want to experience the depths of your love and your mercy and your goodness and everything that you have for us. And so I just pray right now, Lord, by the power of your spirit, that you would start to just take the picture that we're holding in our hands of you and that you would just start to bring it into focus and that we would see that there's a God that loves us, who is welcoming us. And that if there's things in our lives that we need to repent of, God, we repent of them right now. God, forgive us for all the moments that we missed it, that we messed up. We recognize and we know that we're more broken than we could ever imagine. And we're so thankful that you love us more than we could ever know. That the scriptures say that while we were still sinners broken apart from God, that he came for us in the person of Jesus to give us the life that our souls are searching for. And so we welcome you in today, Lord. And as we go out into our days and week ahead, Lord, I just pray that we would grow in our understanding and, in our, and embrace the fear of the Lord, that we would hold you high and above who we are, that we would worship you and praise you and experience the depth of your love as a result. In your name, amen. Amen. Hey, if you gave your life to Jesus today, that's the best decision that you could ever make. Whether you're here in person or the, whether you're, you're online, wherever you are, if you made that choice, we would love to know about that. First of all, you can text the word following Jesus, all one word. You can text the word following Jesus to the number that pops up on the screen. We would love to send you some resources uh, on ways that you can grow in this new faith that you found. We would also love to pray with you. We're gonna have a prayer team that's up here. If you took that step to give your life to Jesus, come up here and let us know. We would love to meet you. I'll be right over here. Uh, I would love to pray with you. If you got anything going on in your life that you need prayer for, um, I would love to pray with you. We have a prayer team down here that would love to pray with you. Um, Kyle's gonna come out. He's gonna give you some next steps on ways you can get involved and he'll dismiss you in just a second.